I want to ask you a question this morning, and it's simply this. What is it that you bring to the body of Christ that no one else does? Now, when I ask that question of people, typically I get a couple of responses. One of which is this, is, is that they, they don't want to answer it because there's this fear of appearing prideful. That if I actually start telling you what I believe I'm gifted at, well, you might just think that I'm an egotistical maniac that, that wants to take over the church, maybe. And so you just humbly say, I don't know. Or, or maybe it's that you're just really unsure of what your gifts are. And in light of that, you just choose to, to not really say anything. But I wonder if there's not another angle to this. An angle where, if we're honest for a moment, that our reluctance to, to talking about what our gifts are really comes from watching others humiliate themselves by serving in areas where truly they are not gifted. 20 some odd years ago, I was serving my home church as an intern, and, and this was over in Gresham, Oregon at Mountain View Christian Church. If any of you know of that church, uh, you'll, hopefully you don't know this story, but when I was 20 years old, I did this internship where I said, listen, I want to do a ministry internship. I don't want to focus necessarily on youth or preaching or discipleship. I, I want to get exposed to all the different elements of the church. And so the leader said, okay, we'll let you do that. So they gave me a couple weeks with the lead pastor. They gave me a couple weeks with the discipleship pastor. They gave me a couple of weeks uh, with, the, with the youth pastor. Actually, I got four weeks with the youth pastor. And then they even gave me two weeks with the worship pastor. Perhaps you see where this is going. I have sung on worship teams. I have sung in choirs. I can do that. But let me just be honest with you. Leading worship is a whole nother thing. And instead of vetting me and putting me through auditions to go, Scott, let's see if you can really do this, they actually allowed me to lead worship at all of their four weekend services. They should have told me no. They should have said, Scott, this is not your gifting. Scott, maybe you should go work in another area of the church Yes, you can sing, but no, you cannot lead worship. Have you ever seen someone like me in the context of your church? Someone who thinks they can do something, but really, ultimately, they shouldn't be doing the things that we are letting them do because we don't want to have the hard conversations with them to say, perhaps this isn't where you should be serving and as they do what they do, you just sit there and cringe. Like internally, just like, oh, I feel so bad for them. But maybe it's not the context of someone being on the stage. I mean, maybe it's someone who has great command of the scriptures. Someone who can not just open up their Bible and read it, but they open it up and they, they aren't sitting there reading it because they have it memorized and they can tell you every different part of the Bible. And so people are like, man, you'd be a great Sunday school teacher. And yet they are someone who struggled to bring the word of God down to a level that kids can actually understand and, and get excited about. And the kids come home to their parents Sunday after Sunday going, I have no idea what the Word of God is even about. And you're, as a parent, you're looking at it going, but you have so-and-so leading this, this class. Surely it's got to be good. But if they're not gifted, we sit there and go, why not? They're good. But really, they're missing the connectedness at that age group. Or maybe it's not in a Sunday school setting. Maybe it's in a small group setting. Maybe you know that person who is who is so gifted at just being able to talk to anyone. In fact, they love everyone, and they, they can walk up to that first-time guest of your church and just start engaging them in conversation, and next thing you know, they feel like they're best friends with that person, and, and because they're so good with people, we assume that they would be a really good small group leader. And so we put them into that role, and yet they cannot facilitate a discussion to save their life. And maybe that's your small group leader. And we cringe when people are serving in those places. 
If time would allow, and if Derek would, would be so gracious, perhaps we could have a special session today where we all tell our stories of people who are serving in places where they are not gifted. But I'm not sure that would quite edify the body of Christ. You know, as church leaders, whether you're on staff at the church or maybe you're a volunteer, maybe you're an elder, a ministry team leader, a deacon or deaconess, I want to suggest to all of us that whatever our role in the church, that our focus should ultimately be on getting the right people serving in the right position so that the church can make the biggest impact possible. As we continue in our study of Romans chapter 12, we are going to find immediately that in humility, we must remain in unity. I want to reread this text that Riker read for us earlier. I just want to read in chapter 12, verses 3 through 5, where Paul writes these words. He says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, and not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so though we many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. I find it so interest, interesting that, that Paul starts with this phrase of saying not to think of yourself more highly than you ought. When I think of the church today and I think of the people in the church, maybe you've seen that person who is prideful in what they do. And, and I think sometimes we, we might even come to the point of, of assuming that, well, well, pride is just something that we battle with in, in the 21st century. And yet what Paul is revealing, he's tipping his hand to us and sharing with us is that, listen, pride has always been an issue, especially in the church. And so as people in the church, we should not be thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to do. And, and what pride truly is, is it's thinking that no one else can do as good of a job as you do. Therefore, you are the only one who is allowed to do the task that you are doing, and let me just say this, is that we have to be so careful in this. And we also have to be careful that we don't confuse pride with taking pride in our work. That is intentionally doing a really good job. Taking pride in our work. There's a difference between the two because someone who is prideful is someone who is ultimately teetering on the edge of destruction. As Solomon writes in Proverbs 16, verse 18, where he says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall meaning that the pride will eventually stumble over themselves. I just want to ask you, have you ever seen this happen in your church? That person who is so full of themselves and they are the ones who think they are the only ones who can do that certain thing and then all of a sudden you find that they are struggling and eventually they, they fall, whether that's going, I'm tapping out, I'm leaving, no one else around here wants to help because they aren't letting anyone else help because they think they're the only ones who can do it. And sometimes we focus really a lot on the prideful person in the church, but I also just want to highlight for us that it's just not pride that we need to deal with. There's also something that we might call false modesty. It's that person who who knows that they're gifted in a certain area, and yet they refuse to use that gift in the context of the church. Jack Cottrell writes these words. He says, sometimes false modesty may be just as detrimental to the church as pride. Why? Why is false modesty detrimental? It's ultimately detrimental because someone is neglecting to use their God-given gifts and in that, the church is suffering because we are not, as a church, firing on all cylinders. And in the church, we need to be firing on all cylinders. And we need to deal with the issue of pride. We need to deal with those who have the sense of false modesty. Why? So that we, as a church, can be fully engaged doing the work of God. But here's the thing in all of this, is that even though each of us are individuals, 
And each of us have a gift. It doesn't mean that we work in isolation. It means that we actually work in unison with all those who are also in the same church that we are serving. In essence, we are all cylinders of the same engine. Paul describes this as being different members, but the same body. And together in unity, hear me, we move the mission of the church forward. But the church can't move forward if we do not work together. Just as a car isn't going to go down the road if the, if the engine isn't working together. But I also want you to hear this. Doing kingdom work together without humility is going to take the, make this task so much more challenging. Our, our call And doing kingdom work is to do it in such a way that we do not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And maybe for many of us, it needs to begin with just remembering who we are in Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, it is not by by works that you have been saved, but by what? By grace. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. You may be a really good person. You may have done an incredible thing for the kingdom, but your works are nothing. Because it's by the grace that you are saved. And so when that person who comes off the street into your church, or that person who comes from the projects and enters into your church, we need to remember that we are no better than them. Because as my friend Mark Hammer likes to say, the the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No matter who you are, no matter what your pay grade is, no matter what you have done for the kingdom, we are all equal before our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that's a humbling spot to be. Maybe we need to start there and we need to remember that. But it's also in relationship to our gifts. We all have different gifts, and we're going to get into that in just a moment, but but we need to recognize that our gifts aren't for us to elevate ourselves and to go, I am better than you because I can do this. The reality is is that we need to have a humble view of who we are and what we're able to do in order to focus on kingdom work and not ourselves. Because ultimately in unity, as we work together, our gifts build up the church. This is what the rest of the text says in verses six through eight. Paul says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, to the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Here, Paul is identifying a number of verses or verses, uh, gifts in these verses. And I just want to kind of overview them very quickly as we look at them. There's this gift of service, which would be the the, the office of of a church such as a deacon or deaconess, someone who is serving other people. And I would say there's probably a lot of people who have that gift, who have that ability to get in and to help others. There's those who exhort, and this is an interesting word because it's one who admonishes and it combines the idea of exhorting and comforting and encouraging. And and sometimes in, in the pulpit, man, we need to do that, pastors. We need to be people who exhort, but we also need to be people who encourage. But sometimes we need to be that comforting voice to those who are struggling. There's this idea of contributing, the one who who shares literally the shirt off their their back to any in need. And the one who is generous, that one is one who gives without mixed motives. Maybe you've known this person in the church who says, hey, listen, I've got $10,000 I want to give you, but in order to, to give it to you, here are the strings that are attached to it. That's not a heart of generosity. A heart of generosity is someone who says, listen, I see what the kingdom needs, Let me give you this gift, and you do what you see best in the kingdom. As leaders, as elders of the church, you do that. And then also there's the one who leads. That's ultimately one who governs the affairs of the church. And sometimes we can look at a list like this in Romans 12, and and we can think, 
okay, well, well, these are definitely the list, but we also know there's other passages that deal with other gifts, and, and, and we can look at it, and we can go, okay, well, is this an exhaustive list of all the gifts that God has given? And the simple answer is this, it is not an exhaustive list. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that these are the only gifts that are given by God. And, and I want to suggest to you that when we take all the lists of the spiritual gifts that are written— and we say, this is the only gifts that are allowed, then, then we have just put God in a box. And some of us even take some of those gifts off <laughs> and say, nope, not today. Doesn't fit my the theological understanding, so it has to go away. And really, let's be honest, is that what we do when we do any of that is we're, we're doing things that make us feel comfortable and maybe what we need to do is this, is that we need to remember that the gifts that God has given, that he has given for a purpose, and God is ultimately the one who creates the gifts. And maybe there's more gifts that we haven't even seen that God is willing to give to his people in a certain time for a certain purpose. You know, the Apostle Paul unpacks this a little bit more in Ephesians 4 as far as what the gifts are for. He says this, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Hear this. For building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human uh, cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Our gifts that we have been given by God are to be used to build up the body of Christ. And if our gifts are to be used to build up the body of Christ, then I just want to make this statement as leaders... We must not neglect our role to equip and to release others to use their gifts. But can we be honest for a moment? If you've served in ministry for any amount of time, I served in the local church for 18 years, and, and there are so many times where, man, it is so much easier for me to do the job than to ask someone else to do it or or to even train them to do it. And, and I know, and we all know that, man, if you just take a little bit of time to train that person, that, that they will do it, and then that frees you up. But it just takes a little bit more time. But what do we do time and again as we go, yeah, not today. Not today. I am just going to do it because it's easier for me than it is to release and equip others to do what God has maybe gifted them to do. And what we have to remember is that when we do this, as pastors and as church leaders, that we are stifling the growth of the kingdom of God. Our job, our job is to help others reach their God-given potential as they use their gifts. The apostle Peter reminds us of this in 1 Peter 4.10. He says, in each as each has received a gift. Not, it doesn't say Scott has received his gift. It doesn't say Derek received his gift. It doesn't say Cody received his gift. It says as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Thus by implication, if, if, we, if we as people in the church are not doing what God has called us to do, hear me, the church cannot be as effective as we need her to be. And as leaders, we need to be proactive at equipping and, and releasing people to faithfully steward their gifts. And there are lots of tools out there and, and lots of different assessments, and I just wanna remind you this, is that every assessment out there is slanted by the doctrinal disposition of the author who writes that assessment. There's no perfect assessment out there. But there is one that I like, and I'll just share it with you. Bruce Bugby's book, What You Do Best in the Body of Christ, I have found to be very helpful and, and somewhat fair across the doctrinal lines. 
And if you use that, great. And if you have another one, great. But, but use something to help your people learn what their gifts are. And then once you learn what they are, help them understand how to use them and actually allow them to, to put it into, into practice. And let's be honest, part of that means that we have to have difficult conversations. <laughs> For those 20-year-olds who think they can lead worship but really shouldn't be leading worship, we need to have those hard conversations to say, Scott, you, you shouldn't be serving there. But we don't like those conversations because they're awkward, they're uncomfortable, they're painful, but they're needed. And we need to have those conversations with people as we help them guide because an assessment is only one part. The other part is us being sensitive to the Spirit, praying and asking the Lord for wisdom. It's, it's taking discernment of others and, and asking for their input. What do you think God has given me? Not just some random person off the street, but asking your church leaders. And as leaders, we need to be attentive and aware of what our people's gifts are and help them discover them and help them put them in to practice. Because the reality is, is that we all have gifts to bless the church. We all, as believers in Jesus Christ, have gifts to bless the church. And so I just wanna ask you this. What are you going to do this week? What are you going to do this month? What are you going to do this year to get the right people serving in the right positions in your church so that your church can make the biggest kingdom impact possible. And if you're sitting here this morning and you're like, Scott, I like what you have to say, but I'm not doing any of it because I got it all figured out. I just wanna ask you this question. If you're not willing to do anything to help get the right people in the right position, in your church, I just want to humbly ask you, why? What's keeping you from making the biggest kingdom impact possible in your church? Maybe it's you. Maybe it's time for you to spend some time with the Lord, humbly repenting and asking him to guide you to do what is next. See, the kingdom is bigger than any of us, and yet at the same time, I find it so ironic that it's bigger than us, but God chooses to use each of us, each of us, to do his work, to build his kingdom, which is why he needs all of us in the right place with the right gift, using those to build his kingdom. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I just thank you for today. And I just thank you for this opportunity to to just share from your word. And God, as we process what this means for us and our churches, I, I just ask that you, would, that you would lead us as we perhaps engage in difficult conversations with those who are serving in places where maybe they, they aren't gifted. But God, I pray you'd give us discernment on, on the places where they should be serving so we can not just tell them no, but we can lead them from where they are to where they could be a place where they can thrive. God, help us to, to steward the gifts of those in our church well. So that way we, as a church, can make the biggest kingdom impact possible. Because your kingdom matters. When the church is strong, communities become strong. So God, help us, help us to lead well. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.